Rolex is one of the most leading luxury watches since the beginning of the 20th century up until this day and age. It boasts its pride and beautiful work, not only on its designs, but also on the quality and precision of its wristwatches. Rolex is inexistent without the genius of an orphan boy from Bavaria, the man at the root of its history and the man behind its great success. The man who made watches that people could rely on wherever they are, be it on top of the highest mountain or the deepest parts of the sea. Welcome to another episode of The Steady Ticker. Do you have a soft spot for watches? Subscribe now to The Steady Ticker and click the notification bell to keep posted on the latest news on different luxury watch brands and its industry. We create contents on trivias, intricacies, history and anything under the weather about luxury watch brands and their models. For today's episode, we'll walk you through the story of an orphan boy who created Rolex. Everything that Rolex is today revolves around a phenomenal man, Hans Wilsdorf. He was born in Kulmbach, Bavaria in 1881, second son of the three children of Johann Wilsdorf and Anna Maisel. His family is from a successful middle-income family who owned an iron monger in their hometown. With this status, Hans Wilsdorf had an easygoing and a jaunty childhood. However, unfortunately, the carefree life of Hans disappeared when his parents passed away one after the other when he was only 12. This tragedy made Hans and his siblings orphans at a very young age. They were then left at the care of their aunt and uncle. Shortly after, Hans and his siblings were sent to a boarding school in Coburg. It was not easy for Hans given the sorrow and devastation brought by the death of his parents, but despite everything, he worked hard and strived in school. Hans then gained proficiency in the English language, all in the aspects of reading, writing and speaking. Little did Hans know that it was a crucial and determining factor of the success awaiting later in his life. After many dreadful years in school, Hans finally graduated at the age of 19. He immediately decided to move to La Chaux de Fonds in Switzerland in hopes of finding and building a more valuable life. In the early 20th century, La Chaux de Fonds was known to be the premier watchmaking region. Hans was then unintendedly introduced to the world of watches. Before discovering his passion for watches, Hans first worked as a pearl merchant. A few moments after, Hans found himself working in Kuna Corten, a flourishing Swiss watch manufacturing company during those times. Thanks to his proficiency in English, Kuno Corten saw him as a viable correspondence to the British Empire and America. As he worked at Kuno Corten, Hans was exposed to the ins and outs of watchmaking. He was particularly fascinated by the watch movements and its accuracy in telling time. His fascination was then turned into passion. When Hans left Kuno Corten, he decided to kick off his career in the world of watches. As an orphan, he did not have enough money and resources to build a watch business on his own. He left La Chaux de Fonds and moved to London, where he met his co-founder, his brother-in-law, Alfred Davis, who funded their business, and together they founded Wilsdorf and Davis in 1905. Originally, Wilsdorf and Davis was all about supply and importation of the inner part of a watch that they sold to jewelers. But in the course of their business, Hans and Alfred saw an opportunity to create their own watch brand and its potential to grow in the market. A few years later, they introduced Rolex, a shot brand name yet impactful, as it is easy to remember and easy to pronounce in any language. Did you know that the famous brand name Rolex had no significant meaning to Hans or the company? The name just rang through Hans's ears when he was riding a carriage one morning in 1908. How about you? What comes to mind when you hear the name Rolex? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Rolex did not stay for long in London as Hans and his company flew back to Switzerland. Hans then discovered his interest in wristwatches. The thing is, wristwatches were not so popular in the early 20th century. In fact, it was even a taboo for men since they were accustomed to their watches only being worn as an accessory or brought through their pockets and most people view wristwatches as something only suited for women. Additionally, possessing a wristwatch back then was deemed to be impractical due to the wristwatch's additional exposure to dust, rain and moisture, unlike when it's kept in pockets. 
Nonetheless, Hans was never discouraged in developing his own wristwatch, which he believed could serve people the durability and accuracy that is more than what everyone could expect. Neglecting the wristwatch skeptics, Hans devoted his life to work on and improve the mechanisms of his watches. With grit and great efforts, his work got internationally recognized as early as 1910 when his wristwatch was first to be awarded in the world of the official watch rating center in Bienne, Switzerland of the Swiss Certificate of Chronometric Precision. Hans's work continued to be accredited as the Rolex wristwatch was also certified of having a Class A precision by the Kew Observatory in Great Britain in 1914. Aside from the robust quality of Rolex wristwatches, its marketing was also an important factor of the brand's success and continued reign in the luxury watch industry. Hans knew exactly how Rolex could make an appearance and leave an impression to the world. Exceptional marketing schemes were made to help Rolex make noise in the market. The first stunt was made when the Rolex Oyster was released. The Rolex Oyster was crafted with a revolutionary case that gave the wristwatch an additional protection from water and dust. Hans saw the best opportunity to put the Rolex Oyster to test. Mercedes Gliese, a British professional swimmer, was given a copy of the Rolex Oyster, which she wore while competing to swim across the English Channel. Tragically, Mercedes failed the competition due to unfavorable weather conditions. But good news for Rolex, within the 15 hours of Mercedes' swim between the waters of Great Britain and France, the Rolex Oyster endured and came back, still functional and at its best condition. Mercedes's use of the Rolex Oyster made enough noise, which urged Rolex to create more uncanny marketing strategies to further illustrate Rolex watches' superb qualities. Rolex placed fish tanks on their stores, wherein the Rolex Oyster was immersed to carry over their claim that the Rolex Oyster had great waterproof qualities. Proving its resistance to water was not enough for Rolex, so in 1933, they also supplied Rolex watches to the first pilots to ever fly over Mount Everest in order to exhibit the efficiency of their wristwatches on air. Years later, with the success of such a stunt, Rolex rewarded Sir Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tenzing Norgay an oyster perpetual in celebration of their recognition as the first humans to climb the top of Mount Everest. In the 1960s, Rolex traced back on the waterproof quality of their wristwatch and made an even better contention. They claimed to not only be waterproof, but also resistant to high water pressure when the US Navy Bathyscaphe, the Trieste, plunged and reached the deepest point on Earth, with the 1960 Rolex Deep Sea Special strapped to its exterior. These extraordinary performances left a great impression on the world. Rolex became more recognized globally as a durable and high-quality wristwatch. Even without the direct presence of Hans Wilsdorf today, he had left a legacy on the elegance, precision and robustness of every Rolex wristwatch. When Hans died, the Rolex company was handed down to the Hans Wilsdorf Foundation given the absence of their direct heir. Despite the loss of Hans's guidance, Rolex remains to be a top-of-mind choice when it comes to wristwatches. Rolex successfully survived the quartz crisis when the Japanese brand Seiko introduced a battery-powered wristwatch, which put the mechanical nature of Rolex watches in jeopardy. In response to the crisis, Rolex had been embracing their heritage and luxurious essence since the 1980s and is now known to be an object of desire and preference rather than of utility like how it used to be. And that is how an orphan boy created Rolex. Did you enjoy today's episode? Give this video a thumbs up and comment down below your favorite part of Hans Wilsdorf's story. Want to hear more about watches? Hit the subscribe button below to support the Steady Taker channel and click the notification bell to instantly know about our new videos on luxury watches. See you in the next one.